All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Jeff Colton of PCCD. I'm here with Lenore Wyatt. Uh, we are the the uh, currently the only two staff uh, that will be working with uh, each of you. Uh, we're still working out to determine who's going to be assigned to each of your grants, but we'll let you know that. Um, the intent of this uh, presentation is to give you an overview of uh, the grant management process, uh, the expectations for our grantees, um, discuss the roles of PCCD in the epicenter, uh, requirements and timelines that you have as a grantee, and then to give you an opportunity to ask any questions uh, that we can provide uh, as you begin the process of implementing your grants. Luckily, we uh, are not in the same situation we've been in in past years where we're waiting to see if the budget's going to pass. So uh, your award letters, if you have not gotten them yet, should be coming out this week. Um, which will formally uh, inform you that, you know, yes, you have your grant, and yes, you can start uh, moving forward. So um, let's go ahead and jump right into the grantee requirements. Um, you're to implement the project as approved uh, in the application you submit it. Uh, you, you should do your best to achieve all the target numbers for youth and or families, and you need to concentrate on maintaining fidelity to the model. Uh, Epicenter staff is there to help you with that, as is PCCD staff. Uh, you need to keep PCCD and Epicenter staff informed uh, in a timely manner of any successes you have or concerns that arise. We'd much rather you you all let us know if you're having uh, any concerns or problems or or issues uh, as soon as possible, so we can work with you to address them. We're not here to punish you. We're here to help you to do what you're awarded funds to do. Uh, you need to maintain supporting documentation for both the fiscal and program side of things. And you may be requested to provide that information uh, as either random monitoring by program staff or a fiscal backup uh, by our fiscal staff. Uh, you need to work to, to meet all the reporting due dates that will be described later in the presentation. And we want, you, we want all of you to start thinking about how you're going to sustain your grant after the two years uh, beginning today. Um, it takes a while. Um, uh, to, to do that, obviously, uh, so we want you to really start thinking about that. One area that Epicenter staff and PCCD staff can work with you is starting to, to, to uh, look into the possibility of getting you uh, your, your project included into your county's need, needs-based budget. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, let us know, and we can, we can help you with that, that process. Uh, and then we want you to work with your, your assigned Epicenter staff on data collection and other technical assistance activities. Uh, Epicenter are experts on these programs, and they're here to, to make your life easier. So take advantage of their knowledge and their expertise and their experience, please. So the top reasons for you to give us a call here at PCCD uh, is if you're doing a uh, program modification request, or otherwise known as a PMR, which allows you to make program or budget changes to your grant. Um, unlike some other state agencies, PCCD encourages you uh, to to uh, work with work with us closely to make any adaptations you think would be beneficial to the project. Uh, I know that some people have worked with State Department of Education. Uh, that's that's limited to how you how you can change it. That's not the case here. As long as you're doing um, the the same project in the same area, we want you to to to, to you know bring some ideas or changes that you think would be helpful to us. And uh, if it makes sense, we'll we'll approve it. Um, if you have questions about the quarterly reports or the fiscal reports, uh, let us know. Uh, we can help you with that. Uh, if there's major changes to the scope or focus of your project, uh, for example, if you're having trouble recruiting for uh, your program and you want to move into a different, uh, a different community, uh, say next door to the community that you apply to increase the number of referrals, that would be a change in the, uh, the focus of your project. We're okay with that in general, but we just need to know that up front. Uh, and then if you have questions or concerns about the fiscal reporting, uh, you should direct that to the fiscal contact that's listed on your main summary page and e-grants. Uh, they can help you. We'll get to the fiscal reporting later on. But if, if you have concerns about how things should be uh, listed, uh, that should go to your fiscal contact. If you call either Lenore or myself, we will refer you to your fiscal contact. So. <clears throat> So the roles uh, uh, of PCC and EPIS, uh, the PCCD staff manages the actual implementation of your project. Uh, we're responsible for pre-approving any changes to the scope of the project um, or requested changes to the budget line items. And the important, important uh, word in there is pre-approving. 
Uh, you should always check with us before you make a change. Uh, sometimes you won't need a PMR. You can just drop us an email and say, hey, we're looking to make this change. Do I need to do a PMR? Uh, if it's something simple, we'll say no and just attach that to your, uh, your grant e-grants um, so that there's a record of us approving that change. Uh, we conduct uh, phone and or on-site monitoring. Uh, generally, that's phone right now uh, until we can, we can up our staff a little bit. We're somewhat tied to our desk. Uh, and then we perform random monitoring of uh, your submitted performance measures. We may ask for um, sign-in sheets, uh, copies of pre-post-test, uh, other information like that. And that's so that, that we're able to show on PCCDs and from, from a grant management perspective that we are tracking uh, what exactly our funded uh, grantees are doing. Our fiscal staff approves submissions for reimbursement. Uh, again, this is uh, important to, uh, to to keep in mind that you're only able to collect uh, reimbursement. We do not uh, put money out uh, in advance. That used to be the case, but that stopped about five years ago. And then the uh, fiscal staff will request financial backup and also conduct random monitoring. That may be asking you for timesheets, uh, invoices, um, showing that you, you put a, a, a contractor position out for bid, you, you would have to provide, say, the uh, the the listing in the uh, the classifieds or however else you uh, you set that up. Uh, and then the epicenter implementation specialist uh, will be the the dedicated TA on the program implementations. Lenore and I are familiar with these programs. Epicenters are uh, staff are ex experts in these programs. So that's where the day to day um, nuts and bolts of implementation will be epicenter uh, assisting you with that. And then they collect and analyze the outcome data from your from your implementation. Uh, this is very important because Epicenter works to roll up this data and provide it to PCCD, so we can then share that with the legislature uh, to basically advocate for additional funding for prevention programs. I'll turn it back over to Jordan for kind of an overview of the Epicenter. Hey, hey, Jordan. Uh, actually, this is Leanne. Um, I'm going to do this slide. Um, I'm a, one of two assistant directors here, and um, I have a great team, and Jordan and Janine Burris and Liz Campbell. Um, we wanted to just make sure we gave you a little overview of how the Epicenter works in case you're not familiar with us. Um, so, you know, what we really specialize in is this whole idea of connecting research uh, to practice. Um, and so what we strive to do is to have good relationships with the developers of the evidence-based programs, um, the funders of uh, evidence-based programs, and the providers yourselves. Uh, and, we, and we work to share information across those three groups so that we can keep uh, prevention uh, initiatives strong uh, for the state of Pennsylvania. Um, so there's sort of five main ways that we work. Um, the first is um, that we strive to develop learning communities for each of the models that we work with. And these really do vary from program to program, depending on what you're implementing. Um, but if you, um, if you haven't worked with Epicenter before, guaranteed someone's going to be reaching out to you to say, hey, join a learning community call or uh, come to this networking event. Uh, or be part of this state association conference so we can learn more about um, how the program is going in Pennsylvania. Um, so that's a really important piece of our work and we hope that you'll all take the time to participate in one of those learning community activities. The second sort of core way that we work is through developing implementation resources and providing trainings. Um, so because we have this unique relationship with all of these um, sort of important folks who work on implementation, sometimes we discover important sort of tips or ways to make your life easier when you're implementing any given model. And so we'll develop a written resource or sometimes a short video that will explain something complicated. We'll post that on our website. And our goal is just to sort of make your life easier in terms of how you're implementing the program. Uh, and then we um, do provide trainings on general topics related to implementation, things like sustainability or, for instance, as Jeff mentioned, how to access 
um, county funding, either through um, the needs-based budget, special grants, um, human services block grants, things like that. Our third core, um, Jeff also mentioned this, is the sort of role of supporting data collection, developing evaluation tools and processes. And I think what's key to understand here is that we really are looking to empower you to collect data about your program so that you can use that data to understand what impact you're having for your community and so that you can understand if there are issues around quality of implementation, um, how you could potentially address those, or you know, if you have strengths and things going well, how you can celebrate those with your staff. Um, so we support sort of data collection in two areas. We're looking for impact. Uh, typically that's a pre-post measure of some kind, and then we also support um, monitoring fidelity or quality of implementation. Um, so if you haven't worked with us before, uh, Janine, Jordan, or I, or Liz Campbell will be um, getting in touch with you to support you in learning how to collect data for your program and um, utilize our evaluation tools. So the fourth thing that we really strive to do is build the sustainability knowledge base. And it's this idea that we really do, as Jeff mentioned, want to keep projects moving forward after PCCV funding ends. And so we work really hard to help you start planning from the very beginning about how to keep your program going. Um, so one of the very first things that Jordan, Janine, or I, or Liz would do with you is have a conversation about, you know, what's your plan? Two years will fly by. So how do we make sure that you can keep this going after the grant ends? Finally, um, we work um, to build in-state infrastructures for training for evidence-based programs. And this means, you know, really that we just, we handle a lot of logistics in terms of coordinating across sites. If PCCD funds, you know, three projects and they're all the same program, we try to coordinate across those sites so that we can have one training, we can save everybody a little bit of money, uh, and we can bring everyone together in a centralized location um, and have a good utilization of training uh, for programs. Um, another part of this is that we're also always looking to develop trainers of train, training, trainer of training so that we can, TOTs, so that we can have you be able to sustain your program locally. So um, if that is an option for your program, we encourage you to explore that. If you didn't write that into your initial proposal, talk to Jeff and Lenore. We could do a PMR and make a plan for you to have a TOT for your model. Um, and I think that's it. Jordan, did I forget anything? No, nope, that was everything. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Leanne. Um, I need to check something real quick here on submitting our quarterly reports. Okay, <laughs> back to it. Sorry about that, everyone. That's a problem with having multiple versions of a PowerPoint going back and forth via, through email. <laughs> um, uh, as we talked about, um, each quarter uh, you need to submit what's known as a quarterly program report, a QPR, and that's meant to give PCCD a thorough summary of the activities that occurred during the previous quarter. Uh, we're looking for that to be as detailed as possible so we know exactly what's going on and where we may, may be able to give you some assistance. So, um, one of the things you'll see later on is that we've now added a, a separate section to the QPR that asks some very detailed questions around your implementation. So we'll see that in a couple slides. Um, the reports are submitted through eGrants. Uh, there is a, a tab we'll get to that shows you how to do that. Uh, you can start it after the prior uh, quarter is approved but you do not submit it uh, any sooner than five days from the end of the quarter. Uh, with, this is because we want to get a thorough uh, summary of what's going on. We don't want you starting a report midway through a quarter just to get it out of the way. Uh, we want as much detail as possible. Uh, both the program and fiscal reports are due by the 20th of the month after each quarter is closed. Uh, so this means that your reports will be due uh, April 20th, um, July 20th, October 20th, and January 20th. 
Uh, you uh, attach the data collection tools, which are a set of spreadsheets that Epicenter will provide you, uh, and any other documents such as success stories, newspaper articles, anything like that, uh, should be attached to it. Um, and if you have testimonials from your participants uh, of a family, you know, it goes through SFP and just are seeing the praises of what they learned, that helps us as well. We're, we, we like to be able to share anecdotal stories as well with um, with uh, with both the, the overall commission as well as our oversight committee and then the legislature as well. So when you log on to e in, in, into eGrants, this is what you'll see. Um, these are the different options that you'll have. Um, the, the first uh, first link here uh, to, will allow you to, um, to access an existing project, which will allow you to see exactly uh, what what grants you are assigned, and then um, and access the one that you want to do a report on. Um, you'll also have a be able, the ability to search by grant ID. Uh, you can see this on this on this screen here. Um, once you're into your your uh, your individual project, uh, the first link here will allow you to enter or uh, update uh, program and fiscal reports. You will not need to do inventory reports. Inventory reports are generally for purchases of equipment, uh, five thousand dollars or more. Uh, this this for an individual piece of equipment. This would be usually for uh, a lot of the, the grants that PCCD gives to police departments to buy either uh, computers for their cars or you know radio equipment or whatever else. We want to track, make sure they're they're tracking. Uh, where all that equipment is. For the programs that we're funded through BDPP, you will not need to do that. So when you uh, select that button uh, that the arrow is pointing to here, it'll take you to this screen where you can see all your past reports, your fiscal reports are on top here, your program reports are on the bottom here, and then you'll have the buttons at the bottom which will allow you to create uh, a, a new program report or a new fiscal report. And they're also included up at the top as well as you can see. So once you uh, so hit that create program report, uh, you'll see a screen that looks like this. Uh, the generally what what you'll see here, uh, it's going to be final report no until the very end of your grant, uh, and I'll say uh, this button will say make periodic report. The screen I grabbed here just so it had some information. Uh, this is their final report for the uh, the pays, but you need to complete all the sections here um, that are listed. And uh, it will not let you do that until you mark them all as complete. So when you go into each of these sections, uh, it'll ask you to complete whatever information. And then there'll be a drop down that'll uh, allow you to mark it complete. So, for example, when you go into the attachment sections here, um, this is where you'd be able to to, uh, to attach your success stories or anything else like that. Um, and then you'd have to hit this button that says save complete or save in process. Uh, and that once you hit uh, either of those, it'll take you back to the, the prior screen here while you move on to the next section. So as I mentioned, this is the, the new section we added last year. Uh, we found that these questions are very helpful for Epicenter staff and PCCD staff to see where you're going. So, um, so the first question is, uh, you know, is it on schedule? Uh, and then we're asking for you to provide any uh, delays or barriers and what you've done to address them. Again, this is so that we can maybe uh, do some outreach to help you, uh, make some connections, uh, put you in touch with other sites that can kind of do peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, if you're having struggles with referrals, let's say, we can uh, put you in touch with other sites that are doing your program for you to kind of, you know, uh, do some thinking through as to how you might be able to approve that. Um, we have, question two is about sustainability. Uh, we're also looking for any details about um, outreach to potential funders, uh, uh, foundations, businesses, whatever that may be. Uh, county officials, if you're looking to, to access those different types of funding streams that Leanne mentioned. And then any commitments you receive. If you've gotten a commitment for $10,000 from a local uh, university to, to help sustain your program, that would be helpful for us to know that. Uh, did you share outcome data during the, the sustainability discussions? Uh, again, as Leanne mentioned, one of the reasons we have you collect this data is so you can sell the good work you're doing. If you're able to show the change in family dynamics or the improvement in social-emotional learning 
or a, a reduction in, in the intent to use uh, drugs and alcohol, share that information with potential funders so that they understand the, the bang for the, the, uh, the buck that they're going to give you and that you know what you're doing and you, you're doing it well. Uh, question three, are, is there anything we can give you? Uh, are you having recruitment issues? Are you having trouble with the spreadsheets? Is there you know, someone that we can help put you in touch with um, to get buy-in from key stakeholders? Uh, question four about around training. Uh, this is to help us uh, determine what sort of training needs uh, that we can schedule on a statewide basis. One thing that we tried to do is really work uh, with the developers to bring them in state for training. Number one, this saves uh, cost to your grant because you're not having to fly over the country to attend the training, but it also allows us to provide refresher training uh, for grantees either on or off of funding now um, to basically keep their programs going. Uh, so we, we try to get uh, the trainings as, as full as possible. Uh, EPIS does a really nice job of putting the word out, hey, we're gonna have an incredible year small group training, it's going to be held in uh, at Kobe's in Lancaster County. If you'd like to send staff to that, let us know. So that's it. Just keep us uh, keep thinking forward as you're as you're, you're filling this out as to uh, do you have a need for additional staff to be trained? Uh, would it be helpful to get uh, you know super supervisory staff trained on the model? Whatever the case may be. Um, Question five, uh, it, it's looking at the rate of spending. Uh, we need you to, to really keep an eye on, on how well you're, you're spending. Um, the funds that you are on are a single fiscal year funds. You cannot move funds forward into the next fiscal year. So you have a two-year grant. The funds that you have budgeted for year one die at the end of year one. So they die June 30th of 2019 in this case. Uh, we want you to spend the money. We, we, we should, I know that sounds weird, but uh, we gave you the funds to with the program. Uh, so if you're coming towards the end of the fiscal year, uh, we, 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 we want to help you kind of figure out how to spend. That could be pre-purchasing things for year two, additional curriculum. It could be paying for a training to, use, to spend down some of your money. Uh, other ideas like that. It could be buying incentives uh, for the different programs that require those. Um, and just just keep thinking about uh, ways to improve the quality of the project and use up the, the funds to the greatest extent possible. The reason we say that is that we lose any funds that come back. They go back to the general to the general fund of the state, and we don't want that to happen. I, I, I'd say it reflects poorly if we're they're giving us money and we're giving some of it back to them. So we don't want to. Uh, to see that, uh, we'd much rather you guys spend the money uh, in concert with Epicenter and PCCD recommendations. Uh, question six, any major events that are scheduled for the upcoming quarter? Uh, presentations that you're doing to the stakeholders? We're not looking for details about the uh, presentation of your collaborative board. We expect you to do that. But if you were able to get a media interview to talk about your, your life skills training program, the impact that you think that'll have on preventing kids from going down the path that may end up with them getting involved with opioids later in life. Uh, meetings with elected officials. I think it's a very strong thing to keep your, your local uh, representatives and senators in the loop. This doesn't necessarily mean the, the, uh, the legislator, him or herself. It could be with their top staff, just to get, uh, get on their radar so they understand that the, these good things are going on uh, in your community based on the decisions they made to provide the BDPP funds uh, in the state budget. Uh, similarly in seven, uh, have you talked to them about you know, the work and, and how important prevention funding uh, is to, to help kids and families? Um, a lot of people uh, in that, the policy making realm don't understand early or upstream prevention. So we're looking for uh, all of our funded grantees to help us get that message out. Uh, you know, and, and also prevention is worth a pound of cure as they say, so if we can get them to understand that funding more prevention programs can offset some of the need for delinquency programs or delinquency services later on or dependency services due to poor family management. That's the advantage of, of putting this, these, this money in up front. Um, for community or family-based models, uh, what your recruitment efforts are. Uh, for the school-based models, uh, what have you done to continue to get buy-in from administrators, teachers, counselors, Etc. Whomever uh, needs to be on board to support the program. 
Uh, again, ideally, we would like to see the schools pick it up um, as they move forward after you guys come off of funding. So the more you can get buy-in from them, uh, the better. Uh, and a subset of that is, uh, have you made efforts to uh, reach out to uh, historically underserved uh, populations? And this could be LGBTQ uh, community. This could be uh, racially and ethnic. <laughs> Ethnically. Thank you. Uh, diverse <laughs> populations, uh, all those sorts of things, just so where we are, are can show that we're making an effort to tap these communities that, that often uh, may be overlooked. Uh, we want to make sure that we are uh, diverse and we are uh, providing services to anyone that will benefit from it. Sure. Uh, and then have you experienced staff turnover or do you ex anticipate turnover during the up upcoming uh, quarter? Again, this is to help us kind of see where you are in the process, uh, see how we can help you. And again, if you, if you lose a staff person, that means that you're not going to be able to uh, deliver an additional cohort of IY or uh, SFP, for example. Uh, what, what do you do, what can, what can you do to improve um, the use of the funds so that we're not uh, returning it back to the state? Okay, so any questions around that? Uh, do I need to unmute people? Yeah, everyone is muted, but they can unmute themselves if they have any questions, or they could also utilize the chat box feature in Zoom if they prefer that. Great, thank you. You're welcome. All right, so the other thing that's due each quarter, uh, by the 20th of the month after the end of the quarter, is your fiscal reports. Um, we uh, basically this is what it'll look like when you create a fiscal report. Um, you have the the buttons uh, the, the save uh, save and continue editing, save as draft, uh, and the submit button. That once this is all filled out, you'll be able to it'll be highlighted here. Um, again, this is for reimbursement. You uh, uh, you can only request reimbursement for items that you've either spent or encumbered. And it, by uh, encumbered, what we mean is if you've ordered, uh, say, curriculum from the program developer and they, they uh, sent you an invoice but you haven't yet paid that invoice, you can apply for the funds to do so as long as you have the invoice in hand. Uh, current, uh, the current system is set up so that you need to go into each of the individual line items to report. It used to just be that you'd report by category. Now you need to report uh, by each each uh, line item to show exactly where the funds went. So you would go into say personnel or supplies and operating, and it would bring up uh, uh, all the different uh, line items that you have. So periodic expenses you enter them for each line item. When all the uh, expenses are entered, they are rolled up by the the category. So this uh, the budget is the amount you have uh, the total budget. By, line, by category with all the line items uh, being accessible by clicking on this link here. Um, and then the expenses page of this period are what you've submitted for reimbursement that's going to be electronically deposited into your um, account. Um, and then the total cumulative allows you to see all the uh, amount by line item that you've, you've uh, been reimbursed uh, to date during your project. So this is where you can go in and kind of see where you're, you're, you're spending high, spending low, and if you need to make adjustments through a modification. So what are the fiscal uh, requirements for, uh, for your grant? Uh, I've said several times we provide reimbursement, um, and we talked about the uh, encumbered and expense. Uh, you need to maintain supporting documentation for all submitted requests, uh, excuse me, expenses, and provide those upon request. This includes uh, receipts, MOUs, contracts with consultants, and timesheets. Timesheets are very important. Um, with the timesheets, there is information on the website to help you uh, set that up. But for all the staff that are uh, being funded for the grant, you need to keep a timesheet that has all of the ways that they're being reimbursed. So if you have staff that's being reversed, 25% uh, on PCCD funding, 25% on PDE funding, uh, and 50% through a foundation uh, uh, funding for a different project. We need to see all the um, all the, the uh, number of hours that you've worked under each of those funding streams. And again, that example is on the uh, is on the website. We'll show you where that is in a little bit. 
Um, you need to submit your fiscal report each quarter, even if there were no expenses. So if there's a delay in starting your project in quarter one and you don't have any expenses, you still will need to submit a fiscal report. One thing that they've added, which is very nice, um, is that you can you don't have to wait till the end of the quarter for uh, fiscal reports. For program reports, you do. You cannot do that till the end of the quarter, as I mentioned. Uh, but you are able to do what's known as an interim report. So if uh, you're running into um, kind of a, a, uh, a, a blockage in your, your finances where you need to, to get reimbursed, let's say you put uh, uh, $15,000 out for a positive action curriculum. Um, as soon as you have that invoice, you can submit an interim report uh, to get the funds to pay that invoice instead of waiting till the end of the quarter. Um, some of our smaller nonprofits, especially, will will do uh, will submit the interim report so that they can they can pay for their staff uh, that have worked on the project. They may submit it every uh, two weeks or every every month. Uh, again, just keep that cash flow rolling. Uh, we're willing to work with you on that as long as you have the backup. Um, we're we're good to go with that. There is no penalties for submitting an interim report. We don't look poorly upon that. We recognize that. Each agency's cash flow is going to vary. Um, some larger agencies are able to float the uh, the expense until the end of the quarter. Some of our smaller nonprofits that have maybe only two or three people working there uh, doesn't have that same flexibility. Uh, so we are willing to work with you on that. Um, fiscal does not have a problem uh, with with processing those. Um, so we can help you do that uh, if you need to. Uh, all expenses over ten thousand dollars must be competitively bid or have a sole source justification approved by uh, PCCD. Uh, so if you're looking for a someone to help you with your uh, your data collection procedures, um, and you wanted to, to bring someone on for that, and it's gonna be over $10,000, um, then we would look for you to either put it out uh, competitively, or have a very strong rationale why the, the person you want to bring on board is the only one that can do that. You probably have been in touch with fiscal around getting that sole source justification um, uh, as part of your application process. Uh, for the most part, those are around the, uh, the materials that are unique to the program developer. And that's all you have to say is, uh, we bought the curriculum through SFP because they're the only people that sell the SFP curriculum. And we are fine with that. That just allows us to show that we, uh, that we are looking to have a competitive process, that we're not just allowing our funded grantees to just give it to um, another agency down the street without putting it out for bid where someone else may be able to do it better or do it uh, at a, a lower expense to the state. <clears throat> uh, by accepting the award, uh, you've agreed to adhere to all the, the terms and conditions that are included in the applicant's manual. The grant you have is a formal contract. That's why we do the, uh, the signature pages. Um, that's your agency agreeing to adhere to everything that, that we have around time and effort, uh, around uh, other uh, guidelines, around um, uh, procedures for competitively bidding, um, all of the, the information that you need to have. This is the current one, was updated last summer, uh, and if you um, if you go out in the, a couple slides, we'll, be, we'll show you where on the website to go. We strongly suggest downloading the most recent version uh, and going through it. You don't have to be an expert on it, but that's kind of the, the, the quote-unquote Bible for grant management. Um, if fiscal comes back to you and says, well, you know, you're not doing this, and you say, well, I didn't know I had to do that, it's in the applicant's manual, and that's what they're going to expect you to do. When you sign the contract, you agree to what's, what's in the manual. It's straightforward. Um, it, it's, there's nothing, you know, hinky in it, but it just is kind of the guide that we live by so that all of our, all of our applicants and grantees are treated in the exact same manner. So as we started talking about time and effort reporting, um, we want you to report the actual effort um, after the work is done, uh, not what you estimated. So if you anticipated uh, having staff work 10 hours a week on a project uh, because they're doing two cohorts, uh, two different cohorts of SFP, and they ended up only doing one, we want you to report the actual work done. Um, you need to account for the total activity. Um, and then, uh, as I said, the obligation to the organization by funding source. Uh, the employee and the supervisor who oversees that employee uh, both need to sign the timesheet. 
Uh, the examples out the, on the, the website uh, are a real easy way to do that. <clears throat> the timesheet should be prepared at least monthly uh, to correspond with one or more pay periods. Uh, we will ask that on a monthly basis. Uh, you know, please show us the timesheets for Lenore Wyatt during the period from September 1 through September 30th of 2018. Um, so that's if employees are working on multiple projects, if they're split funded. Uh, for full or part-time employees that are only working on a single project, we're looking for you to certify that they worked 100% of their time on activities eligible for reimbursement under the grant. That needs to be done, that certification needs to be done at least every six months. Um, and again, you just need to, to keep that on file uh, in case you get asked for. Uh, you need to have the supervisor um, sign that uh, timesheet as well. And this is the case, so if you're hiring facilitators for SFP on a contractual basis, that's considered a part-time employee, so you would only need to certify that yes, this person is, is working 100% of the time on this project, um, even if that 100% of the time is only 10 hours. Uh, that's often the case if you're bringing in uh, retired folks or uh, or folks um, younger younger kids that are doing uh, child care as part of the project where they're not working on other uh, other projects. Um, so the general fiscal advice that we give uh, from our, our grants management folks: uh, make sure that you have an accounting system that can separately identify the receipts and expenditures of PCCD funds from all other receipts and expenditures that you may have at your organizations. Keep everything for PCCD that's part of this grant uh, in a separate place so it's very easy to access and provide upon request. Um, the, uh, the, as I talked about, expenditures uh, for purchases can be encumbered and or invoiced within the fiscal year. The payment can be made after the fiscal year. So you're, if you make, uh, if, you, if we, when we talked about doing the spend down towards the end of the fiscal year, uh, if you uh, have an invoice dated June 30th, you can pay it with uh, your year one funds uh, later on in July. Uh, if the invoice is dated July 1, you can no longer access the year one funds to pay that invoice. On the contrary, any contracted services or training that you budget for must take place within the fiscal year. So in other words, you cannot bill for uh, and you can't bill for a training that's going to be held in August uh, with year one funds. You, you, uh, if you bill for uh, a training, the training must take place uh, within the fiscal year that you're billing. Uh, and then lastly, maintain detailed records. Um, uh, this is an example, I mentioned incentives before. One area that, that we, all, we, we really strongly encourage is that if you're giving gas cards out, for example, giving sheets gas cards or or Walmart cards, or whatever the case may be, uh, keep track of the the invoice. Or I'm sorry, the, um, the 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 ID number on the back of the card. Who who gave the uh, who you gave the card to? Possibly have them sign for that card. Uh, the date that was it was given, and the reason it was given. This is a gas card for families to travel to and from the Incredible Years uh, Parent Program uh, uh, on a weekly basis. Um, so we I, uh, similarly we suggest that you set up a file for your subgrant. Uh, keep it for each separate subgrant. So if you have multiple PCCD grants, set up a separate file for each of them. Don't just shove everything uh, into a single PCCD file. Uh, but again, this will, if, if this will comes back and says, please show us the purchase orders you have for grant two eight seven seven five, you know, okay, this one is two eight seven seven five, not two eight nine one one, whatever the case may be. So examples for what you'd want to keep are purchase orders, receiving records, um, paid invoices, canceled checks, uh, time and attendance records, uh, documents from competitive bids, and then any other backup information to support your grant expenditures. Um, for the vendor invoices that you get, um, the minimum that they need to include, and this is the minimum because this is what we're looking for, your agency may have other standards as, as long as they're stricter than this, we're fine with that, but PCC requires you to have who the payee was, when the invoice was dated, um, the invoice number, uh, the, the description of exactly what you're purchasing with that invoice, either the product or the service, uh, the unit price, what you're paying for each uh, each uh, individual 
uh, part that you're purchasing, uh, and then the total amount for the product or service, and the total invoice amount. So for example, if you're uh, doing SFP and you are buying uh, curriculum and incentives uh, directly from, the, uh, from the, the program developer and other materials, we'd want to see all those listed out separately, not just a single uh, SFP materials for $11,214. Again, our applicant's manual. Um, this is where you go to get uh, the applicant's manual uh, and then all the other materials that will be useful as you're, you're managing your grant. So you go to the main PCCD site, uh, which is www.pccd.pa.gov. Then on the right-hand side in the middle of the page is a link that says funding. Uh, when you click on that link, you'll then see a link that has the, the, uh, the full list there, the PCC funding and grants process, available grants and, and uh, contact grant procedures. I'm sorry, uh, and available grants and, and contracts, contacts, excuse me. Um, so you have uh, the grant procedures, you can see the applicant's manual, uh, the example about the time and effort uh, reporting, uh, civil rights compliance, uh, that mainly applies for uh, federal funds, these are state funds, so you don't have the same level of responsibility. Um, the uh, federal requirements around transparency, um, uh, other things uh, like that around technology, for example, um, and then some of the specifics in the uh, funding announcement that all funding announcements uh, must have. Then on the different forms, you can see a pass-through contract agreement. Uh, often uh, an agency may pass funds through to a sub-agency uh, to, to help with the project. We want to see some sort of uh, pass-through agreement, what each party is, is agreeing to and what the payment rate is, schedule for payment, all that type of stuff. So there's an example here if you'd like to do that. There's a, uh, to use ours or you can use your agencies. Uh, the time certification, um, the sample timesheet, uh, Excel document with the, the template, um, uh, information around uh, re uh, inherently religious activities. The rule of thumb is there's you cannot use PCCD funds, state funds, or proselytization. Uh, we we love working with with our um, our religious partners. Uh, they are sometimes the, the perfect place to do some of these programs. But we need to keep the activities that are being done on state funding separate from activities that are being done on a, a ministerial basis uh, from the uh, from the re religious entity. Um, the audit confirmation requests, the EFT payment. Uh, I mentioned that we no longer send checks. Everything is direct deposited into your agency's bank account. Uh, the EEOP certification, uh, this is now done uh, through eGrants. We now move this all as part of the application process. Uh, property transfer requests, if you're, if you're moving your materials over to a new agency, um, that's what you would use. And then the local jurisdiction waiver doesn't apply for, uh, for your funding stream. That's for the Federal uh, Justice Assistance Grant JAG funds. So if you decide that you're not having a lot of uh, success with your project and that your agency just decides that you want to forego the, the remainder of your grant and give it up, um, you must notify us uh, in writing uh, via letter. An email is not acceptable. A phone call is not acceptable. But basically what we'd be looking for you to do is say, um, Unfortunately, you know, due to high levels of staff turnover, we've decided that we are going to go in a different direction. We no longer wish to, to have the, uh, the grant to do, uh, to do the project that we are awarded funding, and therefore would like to, to close out the grant. Uh, the letter needs to be signed by someone who has contracting authority for your agency, uh, preferably the, the individual who signed the original application if that person is still there. Um, if this is the case, and this is very unlikely, uh, but we just just wanted to get this on your radar that you are able to kind of terminate your project. Uh, if you have if questions about how to do that, reach out to either Lenore or myself, and we can help you with that process. PMRs. We talked a little bit about those. Now we'll get into the, the details about them. Uh, PMRs allow you uh, to change the scope uh, of the project or the budget of your project. Um, this is uh, if you want to move funds from one line item to another or change the target audiences. Let's say that you uh, 
you had originally come in to do life skills training in just your seventh grade class or sixth grade class, and you turned out you have enough funds that you'd like to add in um, your seventh or eighth grade class, depending if you're in middle school or junior high, um, that would need a PMR to do. If it makes sense and it, it seems reasonable, we're going to approve the PMR. We want to work with you to, do, to, to help as many kids and families as possible. So um, just uh, as, as we talked about earlier, ask before you, you make a change. Um, the only items that you uh, will see in your line de item detail are those that have been approved. So if you decided that you needed to add something new, let's say that um, you, you realize that you did not have a LCD projector, that you're trying to do it off of a DVD built into a TV, and it just really wasn't conducive to the way to do it, it like having to schlep a TV around uh, from you know, uh, location to location just really wasn't uh, working out and you wanted to buy a uh, LCD projector. If you did not have that in your original line item, uh, in your original budget as a line item, you will need to do a PMR to add that. You cannot just buy it and then say, "Well, we want to pay. We want to pay for this." You need to get it approved before you can be reimbursed. Um, to add those items, that's all you need to do is to to do a PMR. Again, we'll help you do that. If you buy things without getting approval from us and going through modification, we reserve the right to deny the reimbursement for those expenses. Uh, so always ask before you buy. Um, you know, we may tell you to go ahead, you know, you'll need to submit a PMR, or we may say this email is fine, uh, or, you know, if we t are talking on the phone, send me an email, let me know what you want to do, uh, I'm okay with that. Um, we want to shift more money to our child care line item, uh, because it turns out that we're having 10, you know, younger kids come and we don't only thought we were going to have five, so we need, we need to add uh, more to a consultant line item for that. Um, there is no longer, there used to be the case uh, where we had uh, a PMR had to be submitted, including the signature page, 30 days before the end of the grant. That is now no longer the case. Uh, however, the signature pages must be received before the end of the grant. If you send us your, if your, your grant ends, uh, these grants will end June 30th on uh, 2020. Oh my gosh, 2020. Um, if, uh, if you send us a signature page, it doesn't get here until July 2nd, uh, 2020, it will not, that PMR will not be approved. <clears throat> so uh, again, as you're, as you're moving towards the end of the grant, keep an eye on your spending, talk to your uh, program staff or epicenter staff about what you're thinking, uh, how you might want to change it, and get the PMR in as quickly as possible. As long as we have it in-house, we can work with you on it. Um, if it comes in afterwards, uh, you're, you're out of luck uh, with the request that you were making. So um, we, we'll talk uh, uh, about when a PMR is required, but the, the line at the bottom, I just really want to highlight, you are not penalized for submitting multiple PMRs. We have some grantees will submit three, four, six PMRs as part of their project because things change. We recognize that. PMRs are, are helping you stay on track to do what you're awarded funding to do, as well as keeping PCCD informed as to the reasons why you need to make changes. Um, so when do you need to do a PMR? If you're changing between budget categories uh, that exceeds 10% of the overall project cost, you can move funds between existing line items up to 10% of your budget. So if your budget's $175,000, you can move up to seventeen thousand five hundred dollars uh, between existing line items um, without the need to do a PMR. Please contact your, your program analyst. Let us know, you know, why you're doing. Just confirm. Um, but that's not something that you'll have to do a formal PMR and submit signature pages. Uh, if you're going to do, um, if you're going to do uh, items that are not in your original budget, that will require a PMR. If you change personnel positions. Uh, that's say, let's say you, you decide you have some additional funds and you want to give a uh, salary increase to, uh, to one of your stellar folks, maybe move them up to a project ma uh, manager position as uh, previously they were a facilitator, uh, or a reduction if, if, uh, if something changes where you know, someone's uh, uh, amount of funds are going to be reduced. Or let's say one staffer leaves who is a, a veteran that was making 50000 you're now going to bring a staff person on that's only making 42000 
that reduction you need to do a PMR to change that that line item. If you if you have a person's name listed in the original application, that person leaves. We're going to look for you to do a PMR just so that we can match what's in your uh, which what's in your uh, project with the time sheets that are tracking the time and effort. So if uh, Jeff Colchin leaves and my name's in the, the project and Lenore Wyatt comes on, uh, we want to be able to show, okay, Jeff is no longer with the grant as of October 3rd of 2018. Lenore's starting on October 7th of 2018. So we'll look for Lenore's timesheet from that date forward. Uh, also, if you're changing the number of hours that are worked, if uh, you find that your, your project director had originally planned to work 10 hours per week and they need to work more hours uh, to pick up the slack for uh, missing staff, and they're moving up to 15 hours, uh, or vice versa. You had them plan to work 10 hours. They don't really need to work that much. You're finding they're working five hours. Uh, we'll look for you to just kind of change the, uh, the number of hours that are uh, estimated in the project and correspondingly the amount of money um, that you have budgeted for each person. Uh, a change that affects uh, project objectives or scope. Again, just so we stay on track and we understand what's going on out in the field. Uh, as I mentioned, unfortunately, we're not able to get out to physically see it, uh, all of you as much as we liked. Uh, we may be bringing on some additional staff, which will allow us to do that. We love to see the work you're doing. We love to let you guys brag about how how good it is for the kids and families that you're serving, because that allows us to come back um, and, and brag about you to our bosses. Um, and then uh, this one's not applicable for the violence prevention programs funds, uh, but if you are ever awarded uh, federal funds from PCCD, or if you're awarded um, what's known as substance abuse, education, demand reduction, SATER funds, those two funds do not die. So you're able to extend the end date um, of your project, but you need to do a, a mod, a, a PMR to, to, um, uh, to conduct that. Uh, again, the BDPP funds are one-year funds. Each year's budget is separate. You're not able to change the duration of, of this project. So to do a mod on the main project summary page, you'll see the button here that says Create Project Modification Request. When you click on this button, it'll bring up a modification um, that I don't have an example, my apologies, uh, that will allow the, basically there will be a box there that says justification of requested modification. Uh, you basically tell us what, you're what you want to change and why. Once you complete that front page, you can then go into the budget and make any uh, necessary budget changes that you uh, need to make for that. All right, I'm going to turn it back over to, I guess, uh, to who at Epis is going to take this over. Me, Jordan. <laughs> okay, Jordan. Thank you. And you can actually move on to the next slide right away. So the fidelity verification process. Uh, this is conducted in year two, quarter one of your grant period. So for those of you who are just starting year one of your grant, your fidelity verification process won't be done until July through September of next year. So of 2019. Uh, this is a requirement of PCCD funded projects with a goal of having a quality assurance review process of your site indicating whether or not the program is being implemented with sufficient quality and fidelity within your community. This also allows organizations the opportunity of connecting back in with the program developer after your initial training and having one full year of implementation of your program. And so uh, this allows you to be offered any assistance needed from the developer's team when it comes to challenges or barriers you may be experiencing, as well as allow some time for you to receive any updates from them, such as materials, curriculum, et cetera. Uh, we here at the Epicenter are here to provide support and assist you throughout this process. We will remind you of when this process is coming up and also remind the program developers as well as far as who all will be contacting them to get this scheduled. Uh, we have worked collaboratively with all program developers to outline this process specific to the actual program. So for some developers, uh, there would be an on-site visit for your site, 
For others, there may be just a series of phone calls and review of your program records. Uh, for your particular program, though, that you're implementing, your assigned implementation specialist here at Epicenter will again be a guide through this process and have all the documentation for you as far as uh, what all needs to be done. Um, so while we do have that initial contact with the developer about which sites need to schedule this quality assurance review, it is ultimately the individual site's responsibility to contact the actual developer or designee to set up that specific time for the review process. So you can switch to the next slide, please. Thank you. So all program developers are asked to assess sites through this process, and they are asked to complete a fidelity verification form. Uh, this includes a site rating of a one through four, which you can see right in front of you. Um, this pretty much is page one of three of this fidelity verification form that we have. So this form we can send to you at any time. We have it here at Epicenter. Um, they're the same ones across all programs. And so we send this to you as the grantee, and then um, once it's completed, the developer of the program or the designee, whoever fills this out for you, will send it back to you, and then you will have to support along to PCCD and Epicenter, as well as submit it into eGrants. So, well, I mentioned in the previous slide that this process is conducted next year, so year two, quarter one. That means that this form is then due within eGrants at the same time that all of your quarterly your first quarter reporting is due. So that October 20th, 2019 is when this form will be due in eGrants. So although you see this as a rating system, we want to make sure that uh, we express to you that this whole process is truly meant to be supportive. It is not to determine whether you can have a continuation of funding or not. Um, the developers are certainly asked to identify strengths and recommend any modifications to enhance the overall implementation quality. So as the program developers make any recommendations for a stronger implementation, we will then work with you at your site to address the recommendations by them. You can move on to the next slide, please. So this is a snapshot of the actual form, page one, page two, and page three. Um, we will be sure to send a copy of this out to all of you actually after today's call. So we'll make sure that you have this from day one so you can see what we're looking for when we say implementation quality. Um, as you can see, page one is just that rating one through four, sorry, page one. Page two is more of a checklist for the developer to fill out, and then page three allows them to actually type in a narrative on, on your site. So again, this is supposed to be a very um, positive process, and hopefully one that, that will help, help you out as far as um, continuing your best efforts within your community. Next slide. Again, uh, uh, Jeff, did you want me to keep going or do you want to take it back? <laughs> uh, I just uh, just to, to wrap it up, there's uh, my contact info in Lenore's. Um, you know, we, we'll get back to you as quickly as possible. Uh, email is generally faster if you're looking for a, a quick turnaround. Um, but we will get back to you. And, you know, if anything you want to talk to us about, um, uh, you know, please give us a, a just a, a shout out, and we'll uh, we'll we're here to help you to succeed in your efforts. So, and then likewise, the implementation specialist. <clears throat> yep, and I believe most of us have already started reaching out to those that have just uh, received funding or will receive that that award letter this week. Um, please feel free to contact us at any point. Um, Feel free to visit our website for now before we even have our initial phone calls or site visits set up with you. And one important thing to notice, uh, the epicenter.org extension uh, is going to no longer be valid. 
so if you had PCC grants in the in the past, uh, make sure to update your uh, your contact info for uh, the, the ladies of Epis, um, as the case may be. Yes, thank you. All right, a lot of information that we uh, we kind of threw at you. So, uh, are there questions from anyone? And again, feel free to unmute yourselves or you can submit any questions through the chat box. Okay, well, it doesn't look like we have any questions. Um, we did record today's webinar, and I think the plan is to um, post it if you miss something and you want to watch it again, or if you have a colleague that you'd like to share it with, um, we'll get this posted. And um, yeah, thanks everyone for your time today. Uh, Leanne, did you want to talk about the in-person? Oh yeah, uh, that's a yeah, right. Um, <clears throat> actually, uh, Jordan, can you remind me of the date? <laughs> sure. So Friday, September twenty-first, is our um, in-person PCCD grantee meeting, and it will be held at the Days Inn here in State College. Yeah, and. We're, we're doing that a little differently this year. If you've participated in a uh, new grantee orientation in the past, you know that we've, we've all come together to talk, to go over all the things we just went over today in this webinar. Uh, and then we've had additional content in the afternoon. And what we'd like to do with this new grantee meeting is get everyone together, uh, whether you're a new grantee or not, to talk about the goals that we share mutually around high quality implementation, evidence-based programs, um, utilizing our P PCCD resources efficiently, uh, and we'll be um, developing an agenda that is, I think, going to be a little different, uh, sort of new, and hopefully more value added for everyone just around some general sort of how do we keep evidence-based programs going, uh, how, do, how do we keep quality high. Um, so more to come on that. We're really excited about it, and we hope that you all will register and come to State College on the 21st. Great. And that's, if, if uh, an individual on the phone has, has been to that before, but you have new staff, it might be helpful to send the new staff rather than, than you attend, uh, just so they can kind of do the meet and greet with the other uh, the other uh, grantees, uh, meet the epicenter staff face to face, uh, all that sort of information. Uh, that the the travel costs to and from the um, uh, to state college are eligible for reimbursement. Uh, if you have them in your grant, you can use those. If excuse me, if not, you can add them. Uh, in order to have an overnight uh, to get a hotel, you need to be uh, over fifty miles away. Uh, if you're under 50 miles away, we figure you can do that that there and back in one day. So um, that's kind of the, the limit that the PCCD sets. Uh, Leanne, will there be a, a, a group rate for that at the day's end? Or? Yep, they will provide us a group rate, and they have also um, sent over a link already. So we'll make sure that everybody gets that so that when they do make any type of reservation, they just click on the link so that they can um, get that, that group rate for our event. Yeah. A couple other things I would say about that is um, we do try to make our start and end time such that if you don't want to, you know, spend a night away from home, you don't have to. So uh, we'll, you know, typically not start till a little later in the morning, so you have time to get there, and we'll, you know, we won't go real late in the day. So if you need to just travel in one day and you don't want to spend the night, that's certainly possible with this this uh, grantee meeting. Um, the other thing that we'll be looking to do potentially is to establish some continuing ed credits for folks for this um, grantee meeting and some of the some of the training topics that we'll be going over uh, because we know that those are just real valuable for people and that can help to justify taking that time away to attend the meeting. So um, look for that. And um, Jordan has been heading this all up, and I'm so incredibly grateful for it. Thank you, Jordan. Oh, thank Great you. Job.
Yeah, here, here from PCCD as well. Yeah. Um, I see a, a question from Hannah. Uh, if we're on this call, does it mean we're 100% awarded funding? As you mentioned at the beginning, since there are no state budget delays, yes. Um, the the people that were invited to the call, we uh, uh, awarded 21 VDPP grants this year. Uh, so we have approximately half the, the sites on the phone right now. Um, the official official is the award letter. Uh, they should be coming out at the latest this week, um, but we're not. In years past, what she's what Hannah's uh, talking about is we had not sent award letters out until the budget uh, was passed. Uh, we had to make sure that our line item was not um, eliminated from the final budget. The budget was signed on uh, July twenty second this year, I think. Uh, Early. You almost think it was an election year or something that they wanted to go home and uh, start campaigning. Um, but yes, yeah, so look for your award letter, um, and once you have that, you can you need to sign it, send it back in, uh, and then you're you're off and running. Other questions, and uh, you know, especially for our, our newer grantees that may not have worked with FS or PCCD before. Uh, we are here to help you. Uh, I know it's yep. cliche to say we're from the government, we're here to help. But in this case, it's actually true. <laughs> we, uh, but the, the EPIS uh, implementation specialist and Lenore and I love our jobs. We love working with, with grantees. Uh, and we really believe in prevention. We really believe in the work that all of you are doing. Um, so it's it's our joy to, to help you succeed. And everything we do is, is geared around that, to make it easier for you to do what you're awarded funding to do. Well, good. Yeah. Nice. <clears throat> okay. Well, if not, thank you for attending the New Grants Orientation. Enjoy the rest of your yeah, Monday. Enjoy the rest of yeah. Monday, and uh, all the best to everyone. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Have thank a good day. You. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.